Good morning again, everybody, to our December HR payroll conference. Um, I hope everybody can hear me now. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with the agenda. I know you're all busy, and so are we with trying to finish up this monthly payroll. So here's our agenda, just a few things to update you on HR, one thing, and some benefit updates. And now and some payroll tax issues in questions on time. Um, Sherry Howard and I wanted to remind you about retro action um, in the system and what we discussed in the summer on how we should process these. Um, all retro actions must be approved by OSP or OSHR, sorry about that. Um, a retro action is defined as anything greater than 30 days or for LOAs, anything greater than 60 days. Any action that is greater than 60 days needs to be worked by us here at BEST. If, it's, if the uh, action is retro and it's 30 days other than LOA, um, 30 days to 60 days, um, we don't have to work those actions here, but you still need to run them through OSHR to get their approval and then you can process those actions on your own. Couple things on the benefits side. Um, recently, the state health plan has informed us that um, those employees that are on extended short-term disability with less than five years of service, in the past, we've treated them as COBRA events. Um, you know, they, they're 12 months of short-term disability is over. You, now the retirement system is picking them up for extended short-term for uh, their, their benefit payments. Um, in the past, we've terminated their health plans here and they applied for COBRA, but this is not a COBRA event according to the state health plan, and we should treat these people just like any other LOA. So these people will just stay on the active group plan and continue to pay Beacon, pay us, pay you guys really, um, the full premiums for um, their health premiums while they're on extended short-term disability. At whatever time you terminate them, um, that's at the point that they will be terminated employees and then they will be offered COBRA to continue their health <coughs> premiums or at that time. Of course, those people are that over five years of um, credible service with the retirement system. If they go on an extended short-term disability, um, we will terminate their health insurance in the Beacon system because the retirement system will pick them up or should pick them up for their health insurance. All right, any questions there? The other thing the health plan wanted us to remind everybody about is that the Affordable Care Act is not a qualifying event. Um, just this morning, they put out a HBR alert and, and documented this even further. But employees that enrolled um, their dependents onto the state health plan annual enrollment cannot now drop them um, because they're found cheaper premiums either on the Affordable Care Act or on the um, old individual policy they had. Um, that a qualifying event is uh, um, documented by the federal um, statute 125 and it has to be a change in job or they gain health insurance due to employment. So. Um, they wanted to make sure um, you all understood that. Um, we, all, we continually um, have challenges with uh, leave payouts on making sure we have the uh, one-time deferral form. Over the last couple months, we've been doing a little bit too many uh, exceptions and running them through payroll. Um, usually what happens is um, somebody does the separation actions and somebody um, doesn't send us a form or they don't put in the 416 to do the payout. So um, 
we've been, you know, this is the last month for this tax year, of course, and we're paying extra care to make sure we can get all the deferrals done. If you think somebody should have a deferral, please review their paycheck. Um, if you don't see it in there today, it should be there today. Um, make sure you've done the 416s correctly and let us know so we can double check those. But um, try to get your 416s entered as soon as you do the action so we can be timely in getting their payouts done. I want to also remind you about your new hires. I've sent a couple emails out. Um, your new hires that were hired in November typically sign up for the health plan uh, December 1st, and um, they needed to do a 2014 enrollment if they wanted something other than the 7030 plan. Um, we are defaulting anybody that does not do an enrollment to the 7030 plan. Um, so please don't call us in January and ask us to switch them to the 80-20 plan if they did not do their enrollment. Um, the 2014 state health plan cards have not been mailed out yet. As soon as we get word that they are mailed, I'll send out an email to you all. Um, Blue Cross is still trying to get the data, enrollment data accurate in their system. Um, more than likely, employees will not have the cards before January 1st, it's looking. Um, but as soon as they're being printed and dropped in mail, um, I'll make sure you all are aware of that. Any questions on HR or benefits? All right, we'll move on to payroll updates. Just chat in any other questions. All right, what about new hires on December 1st? Um, any new hires on December 1st or in the month of December, um, they can't not start their plans till January 1st, the first of the month after they're hired. So these employees will be offered the 2014 benefit plan, so they don't have to do anything for annual enrollment. Um, they just, you know, complete their enrollments for 2014 starting January 1st. Um, there, it's just really those people in the month of October, maybe towards the end of October and November, um, that um, may have missed the last part of annual enrollment. Um, those are the folks that you need to make sure complete a 2014 enrollment. Um, so, Joey's asking, can I review the new rule for dropping state health plan coverage dependents that are related to the ACA? Um, the rule that the state health plan is putting out is in the HBR alert they mailed out this morning. Um, they, they are not considering that a qualifying event. So, if the employee during annual enrollment added a child or a spouse to the plan, and now they want to drop that child or spouse from the plan because um, of an individual policy or because of um, the Affordable Care Act, the state health plan says that's not a qualifying event. So they will not let you drop them from the plan. Hey, just chatting, any other questions, but we'll move on to Payroll, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. Um, so last month's call, we talked about this new requirement that all employees need to complete a new NC uh, withholding tax form. So if you missed the call last month, please go out online um, and Beacon University to our recorded webinars and listen to that. I'm just going to give you a few updates related to uh, that requirement today, but I'm not going to go through that whole requirement. So the first thing I wanted to uh, make you aware of is that Department of Revenue has added some additional resources on their website for uh, people who have questions about this. 
Again, I've got the link there um, to the actual page, but if you go to their home page, they now have a big picture and a big you know, red attention uh, that you can click on and it will take you to this link that I have listed. Uh, at the very, when you get into that page, if you go down to the very bottom, there's a few new things that um, some employees may find helpful. Uh, one of those is a recorded webinar that is about 45 minutes and it goes through the requirement and how to complete uh, either the new NC Form EZ form or the NC4 form. Um, there's also two step-by-step uh, -step PowerPoints because it's not, you know, it doesn't speak to, it's not a recording, but it is the PowerPoint uh, slides from the recorded part that will show you how to <clears throat> complete each of those two forms. So again, I just want to let you know about some new, uh, and they've also added a list of frequently asked questions down on their website as well that's down in that same area. So again, um, if, you, if you have employees that have questions about those forms, about how to select which form, how to fill out the form, um, send them there. They, they have some really good um, uh, information on their website now. And again, there's a special phone number they've got set up that's just for withholding tax questions and filling out those forms. Um, and that number, that uh, toll-free number is good through the end of February. <clears throat> okay, I just want to remind people that if your employees have ESS, they should go online and complete their, uh, any changes to the North Carolina withholding through ESS. And again, but before they go into ESS, they need to get a copy of those forms. They need to look at the form, figure out what their allowances and all need to be, and then go into ESS to enter that information there. Um, we have added a, a, the links to the forms as well as some Beacon frequently asked questions. It's on our uh, My Beacon homepage. I think now it's about the third. Uh, item down in the status list. It's either the second or third item now because we've had a couple of other announcements that's on that page, but people can get to that information as well. Just a reminder again about the dates. Uh, Bi-weekly people, their date is coming up soon. <clears throat> they basically have until the end of next week to go into ESS and make any changes if they want it to affect the, the January 3rd paycheck. Monthly employees have a little bit longer. They've got until January the 24th to go into ESS and make any changes. If you have employees who don't have ESS or they want to do, um, you know, something that they're not allowed to do in ESS, like claim exempt, and they have to fill out the paper form, remember that you need to get that paper form from, from them, a signed paper form, and, and complete that using InfoType 210. Um, both HR master data maintainers as well as payable administrators should have the security to be able to do that. For biweekly employees, your deadline's the same. Uh, it's the next Friday, end of next, end of next week, next Friday after Christmas, December the 27th, the last day to make any changes for it to affect the January 3rd paycheck. For monthly employees, if you're keying it in yourselves uh, in the HR area instead of the employee doing it through ESS, you've got a couple of extra days. You can do it as late as January the 27th, but that is the absolute latest because we finalize the next day and then it'll be too late. Um, so please keep those deadlines in mind. I do want to remind people is that um, so employees cannot claim exempt. You, you know, you can't go into ESS and put in exempt. You have to fill out the form. And what we're having is people filling out the wrong form. Um, Department of Revenue really thinks that most people should be using that new uh, NC4EZ form, and that's where they have put the special little check boxes and stuff related to exempt. There's no information about claiming exempt on the NC4 form, so you need to use the NCEZ form. We've gotten a few forms in here where people have taken the NC4 form, and because there was no place to check exempt, they're writing in the word exempt on the form. And remember, doing any kind of writing in on the form in spaces that, you know, extra stuff that's not allowed or crossing out words makes the form invalid and we're having to send those back. So remember that if the person needs to claim exempt, that's the NCEZ form. They need to be, that's the one they need to complete. And it's got the little check boxes like you're used to where you say, you know, I, I don't plan to have any taxes this year. Um, 
I've been sending out, I've had uh, a person at every agency from the last conference call that I've been sending some information to on a weekly basis, just kind of showing you who out there has updated their information in the system. And just to let you know, uh, as of last Thursday, which was the last time I ran my file, and I'll do it again tomorrow, uh, we only had about 25% of the biweekly people who had made any changes to their, their uh, NC4 information, and only about 17% of monthly people. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing if people are willing to accept single and zero as the default, because that's what's going to happen to them if they don't do anything. I have been kind of hearing through the grapevine <clears throat> that a lot of people who they're they're concerned about the changes in the tax in the tax laws and they don't want to be under withheld. And so I'm hearing a lot of people are thinking they're just going to leave it as the default for a while, and that's fine. Um, if that's what they want to do, they don't have to do anything because we've already set them up to be single and zero allowances starting January 1, and if they're good with that, they can keep that. But remember, if they don't like that, I can't go back and refund taxes after we've already run those January payrolls. So if they change their mind after they see what's coming out of their January paycheck, then they have to do it for February on forward. I can't go back and refund anything that we've already taken out in January. <clears throat> Okay, so let me talk about W-2 processing real quick. Um, so, you know, it's the end of year, and we are rapidly closing down for to be able to start uh, working and balancing on our W-2s. So one thing we have to worry about is overpayment repayments. So the deadline to get in your repayments for this year has already passed, but we do have people that had new overpayments that came out in the November payroll, as well as there'll be a few in, coming out in these December payrolls that are happening this week. What you'll see in the claim letters that we're sending out is we're making the assumption that these people will not repay it by the end of this month because that's the usual. But we do have, a, I know there will be one or two people that will want to go ahead and repay it this month. <clears throat> if you find you've got one of those employees who had a brand new overpayment that's coming out in this uh, you know, December payroll and they are going to give us a check back to repay that, uh, by the end of December, just call in the best, put in a ticket, ask them to create you a, a revised letter that has that net amount on it. But it, but again, they have to have, we have to have that payment here by December 31st. If I don't have it in hand by the 31st, we cannot apply it to the 2013 wages and it will be a 2014 repayment and it'll have to be at gross. So please, please, um, if you've got, if as you look at these payrolls that are coming out today for biweekly and monthly, anybody that had an overpayment, you know, claim, um, if they want to repay it and they want to repay it net, we have to have that payment in here by the end of this month, by the 31st. The other thing is continue to remind your employees about making sure the addresses are correct in ESS. Um, I'm telling you right now, we're we're. If, if people start any address, if they get their address changes in by January the 10th, it, it's going to make it onto our our W-2 file. After that, I can't I can't assure you that it's going to make it on the W-2 file because sometime that week we're going to run the file and I don't know exactly yet. It depends on how our balancing goes, but uh, make sure if they have it done by the 10th, it'll go to that new address. Otherwise, it's going to go to whatever old address they had in the system. And when we have the January 21st conference call, we'll talk more about W-2s. By then, uh, hope if we haven't had any kind of disastrous problem, we should have printed them and have them ready for mail, and I'll be able to give you more information about that at that time. Okay, let me let me go back to, um, I had a couple of questions. It looks like it came in about the, okay, let me get past the benefit ones, and I'll go back to the ones that I had about, uh, Okay, so Bob asked the question about this about the uh January the twenty seventh about getting in NC four changes. Yes, Bob, that's the twenty seventh is the last day for like an HR person to key it in directly into the system in the info type two ten. If it's an employee that's putting it in directly into ESS, the last time they can get it in is the twenty fourth, and that's for the seven days uh that, that you're talking about. So again it's it's for bi weekly it happens to be the same day, whether it's an HR person keying it in for the person or somebody doing it directly themselves in ESS, but for monthly you've got you've got a slight difference just because of that seven days. So yes, you're correct about that. Let me see. Felisa asked the question. 
Okay, so the spreadsheets that I'm sending out. So what I did was I I have a spreadsheet that I'm sending to one person at the agency, and then I don't know how the agency person is distributing that across um, across to um, around your agency to other people to look at. But remember, we went in and for all the active employees, we created a record that starts 1-1-2014 to 12-31-999 for North Carolina tax withholding, and it's single with zero allowances. So, um, and the changed by, so it, who it shows did that, it's our default batch ID that says Beacon Pay. So this spreadsheet that I'm sending out is basically just a list of all those NC4s for everybody for this active population. I'm sending it out by agency. And what you can see is, is if that changed by is still Beacon Pay, that means nobody has gone in to make any updates. So the employee hasn't gone in or nobody in HR has gone in, and, and that that um, status of single with zero allowances is what is in effect. Um, so that's what I'm telling people. It's kind of like you can tell by how many are still saying B can pay whether or not people have gone in and, and made a change. Now, again, people people don't have to go in and make a change. If single and zero is good is fine for them, they can leave it alone. And that's why I'm saying it's not 100%, but if you're seeing that lots of your people have not gone in, um, you may, again, you're probably going to want to send some more reminder emails out to your employees um, just to, you know, remind them that they've only got a certain amount of time to get this done if they want it in effect for their January paychecks. Okay, let me see. I think that was my last question. Okay. All right, one more slide for me, and we're going to talk about severance pay. Uh, I brought this up a few months ago, uh, but one of the payroll processing related changes that was part of the tax rewrite for North Carolina is that um, they have removed that $35,000 exclusion. Um, so it used to be that your first $35,000 of severance pay was excluded from state income tax purposes, um, and that's now gone, effective January 1. So we had two different wage types. We had wage type um, 1560 that would not uh, would take would not take uh, included in North Carolina taxable uh, withholding, and then we had uh, the other one for uh, 1565 that was you know made it be taxable for North Carolina. So effective for any payment, severance payments you're going to make starting January 1st uh, and beyond, uh, that 1560 wage type, don't use it anymore. Um, I haven't turned off security to it yet. Uh, we'll be doing that sometime in the next month or so. But um, so we'll be checking here as we, when we run our payroll reports during corrections to make sure nobody's used it. But go ahead and, and remove that one from your uh, list of available wage types you should use. So all severance pay that's going to be paid out starting in January and, and now forever, unless they put that exclusion back in, just record all of it in wage type 1565. All right, that's my last payroll item. Anybody have any other questions about what I've talked about, or I'm going to turn this over to Randy to give you some updates about time. We'll let Randy uh, cover the time stuff, and we'll come back to those two benefit questions. Okay, good morning, everybody. I just want to give you a few updates, some things that are new on the system. Um, We had a time learning lab, time production support and time operations held a learning lab on December the 5th and 6th, and we had about 85 people, a little more than that, attend two sessions. And a very good representation from some agencies, some not so much, but I wanted to provide you the material so that those that you didn't come to the training could have those, and they're online at this link right here. Um, a lot of good information presented, and some of that I'm going to talk about here but I wanted you to have a link to everything that was presented that day. One of the things that time production or production support has done has they've updated the system so that both advanced sick leave and advanced vacation leave are now functioning properly. Um, so that means that advanced leave liabilities are now recovered with normal accruals from vacation and sick. 
as well as if an employee is set up for immediate payments of overtime or gap, those are taken now to satisfy liabilities before paying someone out. Um, you'll see the advanced vacation hours owed, which is quota 36, and advanced sick hours owed, quota 37. We'll also now show on the leave liability section of the time statement, similar to adverse weather owed. And beginning in January of 2014, there will be a hard error generated in time of val if the employee has a remaining balance for quota 36 or 37. And those two error messages are E6, which indicates that an employee has an advanced vacation liability that hasn't been recovered, or E7, an advanced sick liability. And similar to adverse weather, we've uh, created two new Infotype 2012s to recover the liabilities, and in this case, you're not recovering it with vacation or, or sick, you're recovering it with leave without pay because the assumption is if they had to be advanced leave, they probably don't have any to make it up. So um, these can be used for outstanding liabilities at year end or if an employee separates during the year and still has an outstanding liability, you would use a 2012 ZAVL or ZASL as indicated there. Right now, production support is reviewing the year-end liabilities for 08, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and there may be some reconciliation needed with your agency uh, or assistance needed, and you'll be contacted if that's the case. Another thing that uh, has been put into production recently is the, an update to the year-end vacation to sick rollover process. Uh, this is date stamped 1-1-2014. So now part-time employees will be prorated so that the appropriate number of hours will roll over. Uh, in the past, if you had part-time employees, you were supposed to do a manual entry to uh, roll over the appropriate amount of hours based on their current work schedule as of January 1st. So uh, that will happen automatically on January 1st of this year, so manual entry is no longer needed for those. Uh, there are some agencies that may not have done these in the past, so your employees will see this done automatically. You may need to uh, be prepared to explain to them why their vacation balance goes down suddenly and they're not used to seeing that. Uh, hopefully you can explain that to them. If not, let us know. Also, uh, for the rollover process, employees that are on an injury leave action will be excluded from the rollover. By policy, these employees are allowed to carry more than 240 hours of vacation if they're on a, an injury leave action. So those two scenarios will now be working correctly on January 1st. And we have one hooray from agency there. Um, and we've also put in a new error for temporaries. As you know, temporaries should always be positive pay, and so therefore their Infotype 7 should not be set to negative time recording. So if that is set up that way, the first time that time eval runs for them, they will generate this E9 error, which says temporary employee and negative time not allowed. So that's something that, that's in place now. If that were to happen today, you would see that error. And the last thing I have is a reminder about adverse weather that's expiring in January. Uh, this is the same slide I used last month, except I have updated it. Last month, there were 2,300 people, down to 1,830, which is progress, but there's still a lot of people out there with, that owe adverse weather. Uh, and, and as we get into January corrections, once we start uh, initialization, Tommy Val will run to the end of the month and they will error out during corrections. So we need to get these squared away as soon as possible. Any questions on any of the time information? Okay, let's turn it back to Ray. We're going back to Ginger's question. Uh, <clears throat> retirement says something about retirees having to be separated before they enroll in retiree coverage. Um, 
this does not have to happen for beacon agencies. Um, we've worked out the systems to allow employees to um, enroll in the retirement plan and still be active in the beacon plan. However, I encourage you all, please try to get your retirement actions done quickly, as quick as possible, because it is affecting them with health insurance, and especially the people over 65. Employees over 65 years old now um, will have the opportunity to um, enroll in Medicare Advantage plans through the state health plan, and because um, you know they're not terminated in the active group, that's causing some issues. But we've worked out these things with uh, Blue Cross and and the state health plan, and um, <clears throat> employees can still enroll in both plans. And Rosemary, your question is pretty specific to employees, so why don't you give me a call um, today, and I'll try to help you with that question. Anybody got any other questions? All right, on behalf of uh, all of us here at Best and Beacon, we hope you have a great holiday. Let's get this day over with and tomorrow morning over with with payroll and I uh, hope you all find time to relax because we will <laughs> after we do W-2 processing and all that. So. <laughs> we all have a great day.